journey of life is different for all of us, but we all strive to find meaning and purpose for our daily lives, to live in the spirit of things as was intended for each other. Our stories of love and care focus on our holistic connections with our mind, body and spirit. Today we talk to Lucy Hughes Turnbull about her life of public duty. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, to like the video and even leave us a comment. Well, welcome everyone to another conversation. And today I have with me Lucy Hughes Turnbull, who is a name we all know, but we're going to learn a little bit about Lucy's life. So welcome, Lucy, and thanks for making time. So perhaps we can talk a little bit about your your, your background, you know, your childhood. You come from a, a very well-known family who have a very large commitment to community service. Do you think that shaped your life in, in, in the direction you've gone with your career and, and many other things? Yeah, I think I think actually it's also a function of um, the schools I went to too. I think I think you know when I was a little girl, I went to a Catholic school, you know, Sacre Coeur school called King Coppel, and um, and then I went to a boarding school in the country for four years called Frensham, and both those schools had a very imbued into their culture and the values of the of the school, and you know, the, and thereby into the views of the kids, is the the um, the value of public duty. And I think you sometimes get this highly emphasised in schools, which let's face it, uh, on the whole, have fairly privileged kids attending. So I think I think it was sort of like, if you like, for me, it was. it's always been the other side of the coin of being privileged and, you know, sort of being, you know, sort of having a privileged upbringing, you know, in terms of, you know, I guess... Um, um, material comfort and opportunities and stuff. The, the flip side of that coin to me has always been a strong sense of public service and duty. And you met Malcolm when you were quite young. I think you married or met him when you were only yeah. 19. No, I met him when I was 19 and I married him when I was just shy of 22. So you could actually say 22 and almost get away with it, but it was a few, it was eight days off 22, which means that at the end of March every year, it's kind of, Malcolm calls it, the festival of lucy because it's our anniversary followed by my birthday very closely in you know closely following on and and given the fact that you met so young and you've probably what been married nearly 40 years would that be yeah we've been to... married for 40 we got married in 1980 so we've been married for 42 years my goodness so do you mm. feel growing up with malcolm has you know added a secure foundation to your life because you know, you, you, you've been through many challenges together and you've always had this partner with you. Yeah, I mean, it's been it's been a very certainly a long-term, a long-term and, and very sustaining relationship which has been, you know, fundamental for each of us. And I think, you know, having a partner that has been seeing you grow up along the way and, and evolve through parenthood and the various things we've all done, either, you know, Malcolm and me together in careers or separately actually you know gives you this rich base of having a partner who has seen your life so has you know as a as a witness and a participant um uh as, as you know an observer and a participant so you have this you know rich vein of experience and shared memory to bounce off each other with so you were the first female lord mayor of sydney um mm -hmm. what drove you to run for council where did that genesis come from well, um, yeah, it's been written about before. So, so from about 1994, 95, um, because I, you know, I, I decided to, when our kids were like 12 and 10, um, I decided to take a couple of years off from full time work in investment banking and law, doing that with Malcolm to sort of to write a book about the history of Sydney, because it was something that's always fascinated me, you know, and I thought, well, one way of diving into this fascination is actually to write a book about it. So I wrote a book about it and in the process of writing the book, I, you know, obviously did a lot of research and connected with a lot of people who could, you know, sort of, you know, deepen my understanding and, and teach me a lot. And one of the people that, um, that, that, um, that I spoke to was um, the then Lord Mayor Frank Sartle. Uh, I spoke to him, I think, in about 97 or thereabouts, 96, 97 must have been. 
And, you know, and we, we got on very well. And he said, oh, you know, you seem to be really interested in this stuff. Let's stay in touch. And then, then um, I said, yeah, that'd be great. And then sometime later, he asked me if I would like to stand on his ticket, which was then called the Living Sydney, you know, ticket, which was a political party. And, um, and I stood with him in the 99 local government elections. Mm. That's how I got to the town hall and I became the deputy Lord Mayor, um, you know, immediately after the election, you know, give or take a few weeks, of course. And then, and then uh, when he retired from uh, the Lord Meralty to go into state politics, I became the Lord Mayor until the following election. And was that a, a really um, satisfying period of your life to be Lord Mayor of Sydney? Oh, it was fascinating. It was well, fascinating being deputy mayor. I sort of immersed myself. I was very involved in planning, you know, planning uh, approvals and also um, planning policy and st strategies, et cetera. But also it was great working with Frank to, um, on all the work that needed to be done, like, the, you know, quite granular work, like getting rid of graffiti and mess on the streets and, uh, you know, sort of rubbish and stuff cleaning the place up and making sure the lights work literally housekeeping in a in a in a metropolitan in a in a sort of city sense to get ready for the olympics in the city of sydney because there were there were obviously mm. huge amounts of people using the city during the olympics as spectators and as visitors so it was great being involved in that so was that really what took you on the path to you know really fascination with urbanization and cities the, that whole experience because your your career seems to have taken a different no no direction. no the fascination started well before that the fascination started you know casually you know I've, I've always had a very sort of visual visual sense I guess you know I, I almost thought about studying architecture instead of law so I've mm. been interested in spaces and places and buildings etc for a very long time I studied history of architecture for the HSC so it that it sort of led that that interest led me into city governance and city government right so what is your passion for cities and and, and urban places uh well it's 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 because where people are it's it's where you know we're one of the most urbanized countries in the world and cities are where most of the people are. So I'm fascinated both in Australian cities and obviously Sydney is the one I know the best, but also other international cities like New York, where I spend a lot of time, in the way the city works and how it evolves and how it actually does its job to be, to be um, you know, people-friendly and user-friendly for people. And, you know, that's, that's what it's all about, to create places and spaces that work for people that feel safe, comfortable, and also exciting and dynamic. So people want to visit, work and live there. So after COVID, or sort of coming to the end of COVID, do you see, you know, because there's been a real rise in, in local um, suburb communities and major cities are struggling to reinvent themselves and find ways to reattract what was once cosmopolitan places. What do you think, you know, what are the challenges and what should be the focus be? Well, it's interesting. There was an article on the weekend in a in a, mag, a US magazine saying Manhattan's pop population is growing quickly again. You know, like the Manhattan mm. being a proxy for kind of like downtown America, um, and you know, so that's coming back in terms of population growth. All city centres, sort of what we would call we might call CBDs, like the City of Sydney Centre, um, have been you know really affected by. The pandemic and you know midtown in in uh, new york and manhattan in new york is badly affected i was recently in london staying uh very close to piccadilly in in uh, mayfair and that was you know that that center of london not so much mayfair but the but the along piccadilly into the west end has been affected there just isn't as much you can tell there's not as much visitation there's not as much economic activity it will be it will be a a slow build out of the covid pandemic time and you know the revival and and um you know sort of um i guess rebirth of tourism and travel is core to that because all of those city centers to a large extent are you know uh enjoy the benefits of tourism and international visitation and travel and business travel etc so it's it, i think i think the revitalization is closely connect, connected to the re, to the normalization of travel and visitation 
Which we've still got a lot of work to do. <laughs> everywhere, I think. Everywhere. It'll be interesting to see what happens in um, in uh, in in those in those uh, large city centres over the summer holidays because you know, say how busy Paris is as a visited mm. destination, London, New York. That will actually tell us a lot about how the economies are kind of renormalising from the pandemic. I think. Mm. So the other part to your you know, career life has been philanthropy and you've done quite a lot in, in that area. Do you see it as, some, you know, is it interest? Is it a responsibility to give back? Why has it been such a theme in, in your life? Well, well it, is, it is, you know, it's the, the, the starting point is a sense of, I guess, public or civic duty. And the first, the first philanthropic organisation I kind of became involved with in my mid-30s was the... Um, Sydney Children's Hospital was then called the Prince of Wales Hospital, and I chaired the foundation of that. Now, the initial drivers, driver of my interest in that particular fantastic um, hospital is that, you know, our son, Alex, had bad asthma when he was a little kid, when he was about two, uh, two, three. And so I found myself there often as a parent and just saw what a fabulous job it does looking after sick kids not just Alex but so many other sick kids especially in you know in um, oncology blood diseases etc so I was you know really moved by the work that healthcare workers the doctors and the nurses do there so then when a couple of years later I guess like 1994 it would have been 93 when they when the foundation asked me to come involved become involved I thought well that's sort of like kismet in a way because I've I thought if I can ever do anything to help this hospital, I will. And then somebody asked me. So it was like a perfect match, you know, sort of snap, if you like. So I was very involved in that. We've also been very involved in cultural institutions like the Art Gallery, the Museum of Metropolitan Art, um, you know, currently the Opera House, which I chair, the trust of, trust of which I chair, and other, and other cultural, smaller cultural institutions besides as well as research institutions and, you know, sort of cancer, a cancer institutions like the Chris O'Brien Life, Life House, et cetera. I mean, it's quite, it's quite a long and varied list, but it's, it's sort of like initiated by a sense of being able to make an impact to do, to do something to improve, I guess, how, how, you know, people are treated, how people are cared for in hospitals, scientific research, et cetera. So the obvious question, Lucy, is where do you get the time to do all of this? Well, I, I, at the moment, I'm sort of at, at the moment. I have I don't have a full time employment job, so I have a very portfolio career which I choose for myself. So I'm I'm very lucky in that sense, which kind of then drives that sense of there's a sort of like a, a sort of like a symbiotic relationship between a sense of duty and a sense of wanting to do stuff. Um, the, the ties together very, very nicely. So I'm lucky in that in that sense. Can you see yourself going in this direction for some years to come, or, or yeah, are you think thinking, so. or are you thinking about, you know, like there'll be an encore direction that you might consider, you know, mentoring or whatever that might be. I, I mean, I have done casual, I have done casual mentoring. I love doing that, and I love, you know, one of the things that I find so fantastic now is in the work that I do working with outstanding young people, particularly outstanding young women. There was a, a group of women who prepared for International Women's Day, a video, a, a large group of women from very various different backgrounds called Safety, Respect, Equity, and we did a video about, you know, the need for respect for, for women, which has been, let me put it this way, quite a problem recently and, and to sort of to do, I guess, social, uh, to do works with a social purpose to, you know, bring people's awareness to things and to, you know, make the world change a bit, shift a bit. Yeah, I saw that. It was a great video. Do, do, do you think that, you know, the challenges particularly young women are facing now, do you think they've always been there or are they more mm. pronounced? Absolutely, absolutely. When I think back, at, you know, like at my time as a young lawyer, I mean, there was you know, there's a huge, there's a much greater level of awareness. I was never kind of persecuted or harassed or anything, but there was, there were, there were in many institutions, professional institutions, a kind of like embedded, embedded sort of, I guess, sexual gender bias. And I think people are a lot more aware of that. They're a lot more aware of the need to encourage women into leadership roles and to senior roles. And so they, they, um, 
you know, the, the organisations and, and systems are becoming more flexible to the needs of women and families as with, with young children as they grow up. Mm. It's probably a left field question, but some of the behaviours we've seen played out recently are just appalling. And it, 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 it raises for me, don't these people know that they're wrong? I mean, it shouldn't have to be front page of the newspapers for days on end before a board member says, hang on, we really Is need it? to do something. Totally agree. And I think and I think there is, you know, I have to give credit to people like Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins and, and other people like Christine Holgate. I mean, she she stands out to me in the corporate world as somebody who actually was um, you know, seriously victimized, not just in a corporate sense, but um also in a political sense when she was excoriated and condemned by the Prime Minister of the day on the floor of Parliament without any facts being known about her circumstances, the legal situation being known and throwing and basically, you know, the fact she was basically thrown to the wolves was um, terrible and I hope nothing like that ever happens again. But the great news about Christine is she's she's so capable. She's one of the best managers, I think, in, in Australia, not just female managers and leaders. And so she's come back fighting and stronger than ever. And I think we need to follow lead or follow her example and her leadership and um, make sure that never happens again. I agree. I think she's been a great role model, perhaps the, the wrong yeah. word. She, she certainly was thrown in and yeah. had no choice but to fight for her reputation. Exactly. The, interesting thing, the interesting thing about Christine's situation is there was an obvious question that was never asked, in, even in the parliamentary, um, the estimates, you know, that she had to front. When she said she was suicidal, not a single person said, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. So, you know, she was treated so brutally and so unfairly and so unjustly. I just hope we never see that ever happen again in a public way, but also not just that was public because she was condemned on the floor of parliament by the prime minister, but also there's obviously a lot of very adverse mm. behaviour done behind closed doors and I think there's a lot more awareness of it you know by by leadership teams etc so I think I hope that all the events of the last couple of years have woken people up to how uh, well adapt, adapted the culture and the kind of like the values of the organization they work for are and if they aren't uh, well adapted and you know express the values of the organization well and often there are these aspirational values put in annual reports and there is a chasm between what actually happens between the val the values as expressed in the public reporting you know sort of which can be very much compliance ticker box and what actually happens in real life we've got to make sure those two the the values the stated values are much better match the um the uh the actual um acted out sort of lived values mm. Well, that leads me to ageism and particularly gender because, unfortunately, women are still categorised by youth and how they look and we've got a long way to go. Um, what are your feelings on what we need to do? Because just like our male counterparts, we should be able to have very long-ranging careers. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's more of an awareness about that. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be an evolution to greater participation by women in the workforce and in portfolio careers if they get out of the workforce and come from a corporate background. But, you know, as you would know with your experience with your parents in um, aged care, you know, a lot of the jobs that, you know, women do, not the corporate women or the, you know, sort of like the political women, but the, the aged care workers, child care workers, you know, all these people that were the backbone of the pandemic, the emergency support of the pandemic you know if you're working in in aged care it is physically and mentally exhausting and so you can't expect women to do that until they're 85 I mean some might want to but it is physically and mentally demanding so you know we need to figure out good careers as people age and I think that's a very important thing to do it's, it's interesting I mean you could say the same about construction workers. Like you don't see many mm. seventy-five-year-old men being working as brickies, right? But for obvious reasons, because you, your body starts to break down, and we need to have uh, for everyone 
but particularly for women, I think, um, a pathway into a, a glide way, if you like, into older age post retirement. And and bear in mind that one of the groups of women who are most at risk of homelessness and housing stress are actually women over fifty five. So it's a a very real and very critical issue. So you address that risk and that um, that situation by um, by you know figuring out ways of encouraging them or making it possible for them to participate in the workforce for longer and also to create you know alternatives for housing choices for women who retire with very little capital no prop don't own a home or any other property and how can they live a a if you like a a, a good a good rich life not a rich life in a money sense but a, a rich interesting life in in their years post retirement We've been talking about that for some time, you know, about yeah. women being the, at greatest risk of homelessness. Do you think it's solvable? Um, well, I think I think it needs you need to try. I mean, it's not going. There's no magic bullet here, but um, one of the things um, I've thought for a long time is that you know, like if you have working parents and kids need after school care and holiday care, um, you know, one there's this whole cadre of retired teachers who may want to participate in the workforce for longer so um, you know one of the ideas for affordable housing for older people is to actually co-locate um, housing for older people together with housing for everybody else in communities close to schools or childcare mm. centers so they can they can participate in that part of the workforce without traveling too far to work without being too you know, in, in, a, in a very feasible way, because these are people who they might retire at 55 or 60, but they're as fit as fiddle, fiddles and they've got a good 10 years in them yet. And it's also a very good way of keeping them involved in the workforce, involved in the community and participating in the community, which is one of the best things that people can do as they get older is to keep active, keep involved, keep engaged. I'll digress there because when mum and dad were in the COVID ward, um, the one thing that kept them alive, I'm quite, I'm quite sure of it, was the fact that we were telling them the news and what was happening outside. And my dad is what was still very active um, mentally, cognitively, but his body was declining. And he wanted to be engaged. He wanted yeah. to know what was going on. He didn't want to be isolated. And I think yeah. we, we have this attitude of one size fits all as you age, and it's not so. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think one of the nicest um, things I ever learned about was in a um, place actually in, I think in Massachusetts in the US, they have co-located an aged care community facility for, you know, daytime activities, not an aged care home. But um, they have co-located that with a primary school. And so the kids come over. It's a bit like that, um, uh, you know, child care for four-year-olds, that, that wonderful series that Annabelle Crabb did on the ABC a couple of years ago. Um, and so the kids blend with the community daycare centre that the old people go to and they share stories about sport and baseball and, you know, they, they talk about all those things and, and they learn from each other and they enjoy each other's company. Mm, absolutely. So, Lucy, if you were to give the young Lucy a word of advice about life or career because we all as we get older reflect on things that we've done and opportunities that we've missed or even the sliding door what would you say to yourself I would say always stay curious always stay involved and engaged and yeah that they're, they're the, you know always keep an inquiring mind I think one of the the um the scariest thing that sometimes happens to people is that they're kind of like their knowledge base or their interest in the world and what's going on in the world sort of shuts down quickly after a certain age. And I think we should always stay curious and feel like we're always citizens of the world and interested and curious and concerned about what's happening in our, in our, in our local places, but also nationally and internationally too. Keeping an open mind and keeping it curious and involved, I would say. Mm. So two questions I ask absolutely everyone in these conversations is one is to do all of what you're doing, you've got to look after yourself. And yes. recognising that self-care is not necessarily bath bombs and yoga retreats. It's a lot more about mind, body and spirit. What do you do to self-care? Well, actually, like, um, 
walking. I find walking does a lot for my physical and mental state, particularly my mental state. I mean, I don't walk fast enough to enter the speed walking races for the Olympics by this stage, but um, but it's it's just a great head clearer. And you know, like I, I think I, I think I have my best thoughts when I'm walking actually. And some people do it when they're running or whatever, riding a bike. Um, and I, I also do sort of like lots of exercise at home because I don't have to drive to the gym and all that sort of stuff on video streaming. So I was totally prepared for the COVID lockdown because I already do, you know, several hours a day of yoga on on a stream with actually with all these uh, videos uh, from the US called called Glow or whatever, and um, and another one which I a studio which I went to in New York but haven't gone since the pandemic, which has live streaming classes beamed and also a repertoire of, you know, classes pre-recorded. So exercise to me is critical and I get my greatest sense of spirituality, if you like, and, you know, by connecting with nature, which I do when I'm walking in nature. But walking in urban spaces is just as good too because, you know, when even places that you know really well, when you walk around, you learn these things about it about the places which can be like learning little gems which it completely fires your imagination and your your interest so is that a discipline you know walking in the park with the dogs or whatever is that a discipline you've done for many years oh yeah absolutely for ages and ages no, for decades and decades and decades yeah so you're out of bed and off you go for your walk and that's Ma- maybe out of, bed, out of bed catch up with emails you know do all that early stuff and then go out you know, like it maybe a little bit later. I do everything humanly possible to avoid, uh, avoid peak out traffic or driving because I think I think actually it was the Green Party that says you are not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. So I try not to be traffic. Yeah, okay. So last question, you touched on this a little bit. About, uh, spirituality for you is is nature, is connection, is is that how you relate to meaning and purpose and you're part of something bigger? Yeah, I mean, just... I mean, I go I go to church for you know Christmas. I'm not 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 always and and Easter, not always. But you know, I get my greatest sense of spirituality and the and the significance of the universe and everything. Whoever made the universe, um, when I look up at the stars on a clear night or go walking in the in the bush or the countryside, it's that's that's when I have my greatest sort of spirituality hit, if you like. You know, that's the common answer just about everyone says, yet we push it yeah. to the side. Everyone says connection to nature, everyone. Yeah, and just looking up at the stars on a clear night, it's just, it's just, it's inc- it's incredible. When I, when I go to New York, I love going to the um, planetarium, which is a few blocks up the road from our apartment and just seeing all the stars and the galaxy and the videos. It's just like, it's it's sensational. Absolutely. Lucy Hughes, Turner, it's my thanks. cathedral. It's my cathedral. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Thank you.